Hi, welcome to iEducator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today, we will discuss chapter two. And chapter two is all about the research problem. So in today's lesson, there are seven key areas that I'm gonna be discussing today. First, we have the definition. Second, the elements of a research problem. Third, we have the guidelines in the selection of a research problem or topic. Fourth, we have the title. Fifth, we have the statement of the problem. Sixth, we have the assumptions. And finally, we have the hypothesis. And today, we will discuss the first key area of our lesson. That would be the definition of a research problem. So what is meant by a research problem then, or a problem? If it's a problem, it is any significant, perplexing, and challenging situation, real or artificial, the solution of which requires reflective thinking. If we say significant, it means to say that this is something worth of our time, something important. And if we say perplexing, this is something confusing, but at the same time, challenging. And another definition that would be a perplexing situation after it has been translated into a question or a series of questions that help determine the direction of subsequent inquiry. Now, the foregoing definitions are according to Dewey. Now, what's the elements of a research problem? Well, the term research problem implies that an investigation, inquiry, or study is to be conducted or that the problem is ready for investigation, inquiry, or study. Now, there are certain elements that a problem must possess before it becomes a research problem ready for investigation. So these elements should be present in order uh, for the problem to become a research problem. So the first element that we have that would be the aim or purpose of the problem for investigation. Now, this answers the question, why? So why is there an investigation? Why is there an inquiry or study? The second element is the subject matter or topic to be investigated. Now, this answers the question, what? So what is to be investigated or studied? And the third element is the place or local where the research is to be conducted. This answers the question, where? So where is the study to be conducted? The fourth element, the period or time of the study during which the data are to be gathered. This answers the question, when? So when is the study to be carried out? And fifth element, we have population or universe from whom the data are to be collected. And this answers the question, who or from whom? Who are the respondents of the research study? And from whom are the data to be gathered? Now, summarizing the elements of a research problem are aim or purpose, subject matter or the topic, place or locale, period of time or period or time, and population or universe. They respectively answer questions starting with why, what, where, when and who or from whom. Now, in order for us to better understand what a research problem is, then let me give you an example. So example of a research problem. So we have to determine the status of teaching science in the high schools of province A during the school year 1989 to 
1990. So using the elements, so we have aim or purpose. So what is the aim or purpose of the said research problem? So the aim or purpose, that would be to determine the status of. And what about the subject matter or topic? So the subject matter, as per our problem given, that would be the teaching of science. What about the place or locale? So in this case, our place or locale, that would be in the high schools of province A. So what about the period or time? Now in this case, the period is during the school year 1989 to 1990. And what about the population? Who are our respondents? So the respondents are implied to be either the teachers or the pupils or both. When I say implied, meaning to say it was not directly stated in the problem, but we could tell that in, it could either be the teachers or the pupils of the school. So in formulating the title of a research inquiry, the aim is usually omitted and sometimes the population is not also included. Again, take note, in formulating the title of a research inquiry, the aim is usually omitted and sometimes the population is not also included. So in this particular example, um, our title could be the teaching of science in the high schools of province A during the school year 1989 to 1990. So if we try to look at the difference between our uh, research problem before and after. So before, um, you have there to determine the status of the teaching science in the high schools of province A during the school year 1989 to 1990. Now, since in formulating the title of a research inquiry, like I said earlier, we could actually omit the aim. So what we did, we omitted the aim. So instead of including the phrase to determine the status of, um, it's okay. It's totally fine if we don't have that phrase in our title. So we could say the teaching of science in the high schools of province A during the school year 1989 to 1990. Okay, so in order for us to understand better what a research problem is all about, let us go over to the different guidelines in the selection of a research problem or topic. Now, there are certain guidelines or criteria in the selection of a research problem to make it more interesting and the research work more enjoyable to the researcher as well as to ensure the completion of the study. Now, among the guidelines or criteria are the following, which may also be considered as characteristics of research problems. So first, we have the research problem or topic must be chosen by the researcher himself. Why is that so? Because this is to avoid blaming others or offering excuses for any obstacle encountered. So as much as possible, you should be the ones uh, to select your research problem or topic. Now, second guideline, it must be within the interest of the researcher. So why is that? Because this is to make sure that the researcher will focus his full attention on the research work because if you choose or select a research problem or topic that is out of your interest, then chances are you will not complete, okay? You will not complete your own research study. So as much as possible, when selecting a research problem or topic, it should be within your interest. And third, we have 
it must be within the specialization of the researcher. It should be within the specialization of the researcher because this will in some way make the work easier for him because he is working on familiar grounds. Besides, this may improve his specialization, his skill, and competence as well in his profession. So it's really not ideal if you select a research problem or topic that is not related to your own profession or course because chances are um, you will have a difficult time, you will have an arduous time finishing or completing your own research study. So as much as possible, your selected topic or problem should be inclined with your own specialization. And fourth, we have, it must be within the competence of the researcher to tackle. Now here, the researcher must know the method of research and other research procedures applicable to his problem, and he must know how to apply them as well. So he must have a workable understanding of his study. And the fifth guideline we have, it must be within the ability of the researcher to finance. Otherwise, he must be able to find funding for his research because we cannot deny the fact that if we conduct a research study, it would really entail cost, okay? A significant amount of money. And so for that matter, the researcher should be prepared financially because research, like I said earlier, involves not a small amount of expense and the researcher must be able to foot the bills until his study is completed. So there must be a budget which he must be able to shoulder. And number six guideline, it is researchable and manageable. That is, data are available and accessible. If we say available and accessible, the researcher must be sure that the participants in his investigation possess the needed data and that they are within his reach. So one must not choose a problem in which the locations of the data are too far away, say for foreign islands or other countries, okay? So as much as possible, the data should be readily available and accessible. And next we have the data must meet the standards of accuracy, objectivity, and verifiability. This is very important. Why? Because the data gathered must be accurate, objective, and not biased, and can be verified if there arises a need. Otherwise, the results of the study will not be valid, and the generalizations formulated will be faulty as well. And let us see, Answers to the specific questions or sub-problems can be found, meaning to say the data to be collected must supply the necessary answers to the specific questions. So, for example, suppose the question is, how qualified are the teachers handling science? So the data to be gathered are the educational attainments and the fields of specialization of the teachers to be checked against the regulations of the school system. So if we see ed educational attainments, uh, we should see to it if, uh, if the teacher handling science is only a bachelor's graduate or is he or she a master's graduate or is he or she a doctor's graduate, and so on and so forth, okay? Because from, from there, uh, we can really tell that the teacher is qualified if um, he or she has postgraduate degrees. So this way, the answer to the question can be found. And for letter D, the hypothesis formulated are testable. That is, they can be accepted or rejected. Remember, hypotheses are not proved. They are only determined as true or not. 
So if the findings from the data do not conform to the hypothesis, so the latter are rejected. If the findings conform to the hypothesis, then the latter are accepted as true and valid. And for letter E, it is researchable and manageable if the equipment and instruments for research are available and can give valid and reliable results. What do I mean by this? What I mean about this is that the construction and validation of research instruments are fully discussed in the later chapter. And for letter um, number seven, rather, the seventh guideline, that would be, it can be completed within a reasonable period of time unless it is a longitudinal research which takes a long time for its completion. So although research is unheard, there must be a timetable for its completion. So for graduate students engaged in social and educational research, a research project for a master's thesis must be completed within three years from the time the academic work has been completed and for a doctoral dissertation, five years. So this is according to regulation. And for the number eight guideline, it is significant, important, and relevant to the present time and situation, timely, and of current interest. This means that the research project must be able to make a substantial impact upon situations and people it is intended for or addressed to. So it must be able to arouse the interest of the people concerned. If the study is about drug abuse, for example, then it must be able to draw attention of those engaged in the habit and those assigned to stop it, okay? And for the number nine guideline, the results are practical and implementable. So what do we mean about this? Now, here, if the investigation is about drug addiction, are the recommendations for its eradication applicable with the expected effectiveness? So that's one question that the researcher should ask himself. Okay. And for number 10 guideline, it requires original, critical, and reflective thinking to solve it. So to be able to apply these, the research project must be novel, new, and original. Meaning to say, it should not be something that is only copied. Again, that is a big no, no. So instead, it should be novel, new, and original. The study is considered novel and new if it has not yet been studied before and the data are gathered from new and original sources. However, the study may be a replication, that is, the study has already been conducted but in another place, not in the place where it is intended to be studied again. So the purpose of the study replications is to determine if conditions in one place are also true in another places so that generalizations of wider application can be formulated. And for number 11 guidelines, or guideline rather, it can be delimited to suit the resources of the researcher but big or large enough to be able to give significant valid and reliable results and generalization so the area and population may be reduced but only to such an extent that the generalizations can be considered true and useful so the next guideline that we have that would be it must contribute to the national development or so the next guideline that we have it must contribute to the national development goals for the improvement of the quality of human life now this is the ultimate aim of research to improve the quality of human life so that is why we continuously conduct research Okay, 
there is always continuous improvement or Kaizen because we want to provide as much as possible quality human life. So this is the ultimate aim of research. Research must improve or show how to improve unsatisfactory conditions. And number 13, it must contribute to the fund of human knowledge, meaning all the facts and knowledge that we have are mostly the products of research. So any study to be conducted must add a new bit of knowledge to what we already have. And number 14, it must show or pave the way for the solution of the problem or problems intended to be solved. So usually, after an inquiry has been conducted, recommendations are made for the solution of problems discovered, which, if implemented, can solve the problems. And for number 15, it must not undermine the moral and spiritual values of the people, meaning to say it must not advocate the promotion of antisocial values such as drug addiction, cruelty, hatred, divisiveness, multiple sex mating, etc. So as much as possible, it must advocate the promotion of divine values and those admirable human values such as love, peace, goodwill, etc. Okay? And for number 16 guideline, it must not advocate any change in the present order of things by means of violence, but by peaceful means. Meaning to say, it must not advocate subversion, revolution, or the like to wrest control of the government or change the form of government. So if there is a needed change, it must be made by any means, but the means must be peaceful and legitimate. And number 17, there must be a return of some kind to the researcher, either one or all of the following, if the research report is completed. First, we have monetary. So either increase in salary or publication of the results in which there is some kind of royalty. So that is why uh, mostly if you can notice, if you have teachers or instructors who are just bachelor's degree graduates, they actually um, study master's studies and or graduate studies or postgraduate studies because uh, they will be given incentives by the schools or universities where they are currently uh, teaching as well, okay? So that is some kind of a return to them in a way of increase in salary. And for letter B, advancement of position or promotion. So generally, after finishing a graduate course, there is a promotion, especially in the educational system. Like I said earlier, if you are working in the education sector, like you are a deaf ed teacher, so most likely if you are a doctor graduate, then you will be promoted uh, right away. Or if not right away, you will be given promotion. And that is a guaranteed promotion, okay? So it is easier to get a promotion with a graduate degree than without one. And for letter C, improved specialization, competence and skill in professional work, especially if the research subject is related to the profession. So supposing a teacher makes a study of the school management practices of school principals in a certain area. So when this teacher gets promoted to the principalship, he already knows how to manage his own school because of what he has learned from his study about the practices of the principles he has studied. So that's one of the many perks of being a researcher. And for letter D, enhance prestige and reputation. So usually, it is a big honor, especially among colleagues on the part of one who completes a research project and be able to write a thesis about his research project. This is so because of the intellectual activity 
effort making capacity and big expenses involved in the work and of course because of a higher degree earned and for letter a satisfaction of intellectual curiosity and interest and being able to discover truth so it is always our experience that after being able to solve a difficult intellectual problem we are engulfed with so much elation and satisfaction that we forget all the sacrifices and difficulties that we have gone through so this is also the feeling of those who are able to finish the research project and reports, the latter in the forms of thesis or dissertations, especially after passing a very rigid oral defense. All right, so the number 18 and the final guideline, that would be there must be a consideration of the hazards involved, either physical, social, or legal so this author knows of a man who went to the mountains to study a tribe so ignoring physical dangers from wild animals and from the tribesmen themselves so while this act is admirable the researcher must also consider his personal safety so another hazard is social so especially right now with the advent of covid 19 pandemic it's really difficult to conduct research because you are, your movements are very limited. Okay? You cannot just merely go out directly from your house and then go somewhere, conduct research study or research uh, questionnaires and so on and so forth. Okay? So this occurs when an inquiry happens to encroach upon socially approved and established social values norms of conduct or ethical standards so the inquiry may draw the ire of the populace and the researcher may receive some kind of rebook censure criticism or derision so still another hazard aside from social is legal so if an investigation may affect adversely the honor and integrity of certain people a libel suit may and so, so of course it does not matter much if the researcher can prove his facts to be true and if he is a crusader he will be admired for his boldness to discover and tell the truth no matter who gets hurt a study about graft and corruption in the government is an example all right so this ends our discussion on the different guidelines in the selection of a research problem or topic so the next key area that we're gonna be discussing right now that would be the title now guidelines in writing the title so here's the following guidelines so the thesis writer should be guided by the following in the formulation of his title so these are also the characteristics of title so first generally the title is formulated before the start of the research work again it should be formulated before the start of the research work it may be revised and refined later if there is a need okay and second the title must contain the subject matter of the study the locale of the study the population involved the period when the data were gathered or will be gathered so this is um the same with what we discussed earlier okay based on the example uh, given earlier and for number three it must be broad enough to include all aspects of the subject matter studied or to be studied meaning to say the title indicates what is expected to be found inside the thesis report and for number four it must be as brief and concise as possible a number five guideline in writing a title you we should avoid using the terms an analysis of a study of an investigation of and the like all these things are understood to have been done or to be done when a research is conducted 
Okay, you have to take note about that. And for number six guideline, if the title contains more than one line, it must be written like an inverted pyramid, all words in capital letters. So for example, okay, this is an example of a complete title. So our title, the teaching of science in the high schools of province A as perceived by the science teachers and students during the school year 1989 to 1990. Again, so if the title contains more than one line, since it contains more than one line, so what we did, we wrote this one like an inverted pyramid, all words in capital letter. So the contents are required by guideline number two. So going back to guideline number two, it says the title must contain the subject matter, the locale of the study, the population involved, and the period. So let's try to see if it encompasses all of these contents in the guideline number two. So subject matter. So where is our subject matter there? So in regards to our given a sample title, our subject matter is the teaching of science. And the locale of the study, that would be high schools of province A. And the population involved, we have the science teachers and students. And the period of time, or the period or time rather, that would be school year 1989 to 1990. So is this a long title what do you think the teaching of science in the high schools of province a as perceived by the science teachers and students during the school year 1989 to 1990 so going back to my question do you think it's a lengthy title because take note that in guideline number four it says it must be as brief and concise as possible so if i were to be asked Yes, this is quite a lengthy title. So how do we make this a brief and concise form of the title and a better one? So a better one, so this is our first title, the before one, and we have the after one or the one that is being shortened. So before, our title was the teaching of science in the high schools of province A, as perceived by the science teachers and students during the school year 1989 to 1990. So since this is a lengthy title and guideline number four says it must be as brief and concise as possible. So when we shorten this, uh, we could say the teaching of science in the high schools of province A. Now, do you think this is accepted? Well, it will be noted that the population the science teachers and the students, as well as the period of the study, 1989 to 1990, are being omitted, right? When writing the second form, but they have to be mentioned in the scope and delimination of the study. So the first title, which was the complete one, that is correct, okay? And the second title, that is the shortened one, that is also correct. So... The only difference is that in the second title that we did, we omitted the population, which is the science teachers and the students, and we also um, omitted the period of the study, which is the 1989 to 1990. That's okay if we omit those. However, the second form... Um, However, they have to be mentioned in the scope and delimination of your study. So it will be noted also that the title, though brief and simplified, is broad enough to include all possible aspects of the subject matter. So the central theme, which is the teaching of science, is also very clear. Okay, so that's how we select a research title and the next key area that we're gonna be discussing right now that would be the statement of the problem so 
uh, guidelines, these are the guidelines in formulating the general problem and the specific subproblems or specific questions. Again, um, like I discussed in the last semester, so if you can notice, when we did our thesis, the statement of problem is divided into two parts. We have the general statement of the problem, and we also have the specific statement of the problem. So these are also the characteristics of specific questions. So the following are suggested to guide the researcher in the formulation of his general as well as his specific subproblems or questions. So these are also the characteristics of specific questions. So uh, guideline number one, the general statement of the problem and the specific subproblems or questions should be formulated first before conducting the research. Again. Take note that before you start conducting your research study, the general statement of the problem and the specific subproblems or questions should be formulated first. And second, it is customary to state specific subproblems in the interrogative form. Hence, subproblems are called specific questions, right? Because you can actually um, have your specific problems in interrogative form. And number three, each specific question must be clear and unequivocal. That is, it has only one meaning. So it must not have dual meanings. And number four, each specific question is researchable apart from the other questions. That is... Answers to each specific question can be found even without considering the other questions. Okay, you need to take note about that. And number five, each specific question must be based upon known facts and phenomena. So what do we mean by this? This means that besides data from such known facts and phenomena must be accessible to make the specific questions researchable. And number six guideline, answers to each specific question can be interpreted apart from the answers to other specific questions. And for number seven, answers to each specific question must contribute to the development of the whole research problem or topic. And number eight, Summing up the answers to all the specific questions will give a complete development of the entire study. And finally, the number of specific questions should be enough to cover the development of the whole research problem or study. So before writing down your specific questions, Take note that you need to determine first the different aspects of the research problem to be studied and then for each aspect which you have determined, make one specific question with sub-questions if there is a need. So if the research topic is the teaching of science, the different aspects may be the following. So first, we have the qualifications of the teachers, especially the educational qualification. Second, we have the methods and strategies of teaching used and their level of effectiveness. You have also to take note about that. And number three, or let us see, facilities available. Are there any enough facilities in school available for teaching science? What about the instructional materials and non-instructional materials and their adequacy? For letter D, adequacy of su supervisory assistance extended to teachers. So is the assistance extended to science teachers adequate enough to be able to um, really accomplish the task? Okay, and we also have Comparison between the perceptions of the teachers and those of the students concerning the different aspects. 
we have problems encountered by the teachers in teaching science. Are these problems documented? And if they are, then are they, is there any action or are there any actions taken to solve the problem? Okay, so we also have proposals to solve or help solve the problems. And we also have implications of the study to the teaching of science. And number 10, generally, there should be a general statement of the problem. And then this should be broken up into as many sub-problems or specific questions as necessary. So in order for us to better understand this, let me give you an example. So for example, this study was conducted to investigate all aspects of the teaching of science in the high schools of province A during the school year 1989 to 1990 as perceived by the science teachers and students. So this one, this is what we call the general problem. Again, this is what we call the general problem. Now, remember your statement of the problem is divided into two parts. You have the general statement of the problem and you have the specific statement of the problem. So since we already have the general statement of the problem, we will now go over to the specific statement of the problem. So our specific statement of the problem starts with saying, Specifically, the study attempted to answer the following questions. Number one, how qualified are the teachers handling science in the high schools of province A? Number two, how effective are the methods and strategies used by the teachers in teaching science? Number three, how adequate are the instructional as well as the non-instructional facilities for the teaching of science? Number four, how adequate are the forms of supervisory assistance extended to the teachers relative to the teaching of science? Number five, is there any significant difference between the perceptions of the teachers and those of the students concerning the different aspects in the teaching of science? For number six, what problems are being encountered by the teachers of science? And number seven, what suggestions are offered by the teachers and students to improve the teaching of science? And finally, what are the implications of the findings to the teaching of the study? Okay, so this ends our discussion of the statement of the problem. Again, uh, remember there are two types of statement of the problem. We have the general statement of the problem and we also have the specific statement of the problem and the sub-problems should be in interrogative form. Okay, so the next key area that we're going to be discussing right now, that would be the assumptions. And if we say assumption, it is a self-evident truth which is based upon a known fact or phenomenon. So oftentimes, especially in descriptive and historical researches, assumptions are not explicitly expressed but left implicit that is they are unwritten so generally every specific question is implicitly based upon an assumption so if there is no assumption expressed or implicit there can be no specific question so for example so you have their specific question how qualified are the teachers handling signs? So the implicit or unwritten assumption, there are certain qualifications that one should possess before he can teach signs, which is correct, right? If that makes sense. And number two example, specific question is, how adequate are the facilities that a school should acquire before it can offer science as a subject. 
So the implicit assumption or the unwritten assumption, there are certain required facilities that a school should acquire before it can offer science as a subject. And for number three um, example, our specific question is, how effective are the methods used in the teaching of science? So our implicit assumption, there are certain required facilities that a school should acquire before it can offer science as a subject. So the guidelines in the use of basic assumptions, the following are the guidelines in the use of uh, basic assumptions. So first guideline you have, you cannot assume the value of your study. What do we mean by this? If we say we cannot assume the value of your study, what I mean about this is that such an argument should have been made under the section, significance of the study. And second, you cannot assume the reliability of the instruments you propose to use in your research. So such irrationality and defense should be made under methodology. And for number three, you cannot assume the validity of basic data. Remember, validity is established under methodology. And for number four, you cannot assume that your population is typical. So this point is to be made under methodology as well. And for number five, an assumption is not tested, neither is it defended nor argued. Okay, so this is all about the basic assumptions. And for the hypothesis, remember that hypothesis is a tentative conclusion or answer to a specific question raised at the beginning of the investigation. So it is an educated guess about the answer to a specific question. Now, there are forms, there are two forms of hypothesis. First, we have the operational form. And second, we have the null form, okay? So one is the operational and the other one is null. So if we see operational form, it is stated in the affirmative while the null form is stated in the negative. So the operational form states that there is a difference between two phenomena while the null form states that there is no difference between uh, the phenomena or between the two phenomena. So in other words, the null form expresses equality between two phenomena. So this is more commonly used, the null form. And what about the guidelines in formulating of explicit hypothesis? Now the following are the guidelines in the formulation of the explicit hypothesis. First, in experimental investigations, hypotheses have to be explicit. They have to be expressed, okay? So meaning to say, this should be written in your manuscript. So they have to be expressed also in comparative and correlational studies. On the other hand, in descriptive and historical investigations, hypotheses are seldom expressed, if not entirely absent. So the sub-problems or specific questions raised before the start of the investigation and stated under the statement of the problem serve as the hypothesis. So the specific questions serve as the hypothesis. And with this fact, it is logical to presume that all studies in research have hypotheses, and for that matter, all theses and dissertations have their own respective hypothesis as well. And consequently, no research is conducted without any hypothesis at all. All right? So for number three, hypotheses are usually stated in the null form like i said earlier the null form is the commonly used be, uh, because testing a null hypothesis is easier than a hypothesis in the 
operational form. So testing a hypothesis simply means gathering data to answer it. And for number four, hypotheses are formulated from specific questions upon which they are based. Now, in order for us to better understand a hypothesis, let me give you an example. So, supposing we have the question, is there any significant difference between the perception of the teachers and those of the students concerning the different aspects in the teaching of science? So, if we say, or if we make use of operational hypothesis, it should be stated as there is a significant difference between the perceptions of the teachers and those of the students concerning the different aspects in the teaching of science. But in the null hypothesis, this is usually stated in negative form. So you would say there is no significant difference between the perceptions of the teachers and those of the students concerning the different aspects in the teaching of science. Okay, another example. Is there any significant difference between the effectiveness of the inductive method and that of the deductive method in the teaching of science? So if you make use of operational hypothesis, you would say there is a significant difference between the effectiveness of the inductive method and that of the deductive method in the teaching of science. Well, on the other hand, if we make use of null hypothesis, you should say there is no significant difference between the effectiveness of the inductive method and that of the deductive method in the teaching of science. So what about the purposes? What are the purposes, functions, and importance of hypothesis or specific questions? Well, first, they help the researcher in designing his study. So what methods, research instruments, sampling design, and statistical treatments to use, sampling design and statistical treatments to use, what data to gather, etc. Second purpose or function, they actually serve as basis for determining assumptions, like I said earlier. And for number three, they serve as basis for determining the relevance of the data. And for number four, they serve as basis for determining and for number four, they serve as basis for the explanation of and number four, they serve as basis for the explanation or discussion about the data gathered. And lastly, they help or guide the researcher in consolidating his findings and in formulating his conclusion. So generally, findings and conclusions are actually answers to the hypothesis or specific questions raised at the start of the investigation. So as you can notice, if you had conducted a research study in the past, normally the um, findings, recommendations, and conclusions can be found in chapter five. So if you do your chapter five, the findings, conclusions, and recommendations, so you should be basing your answers there from your hypothesis or specific questions that you raised at the start of the investigation. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. If you have questions, please let me know in the comment section below. And if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.